Hey. It's time. Woo. It's time for the show. And Nermal's back from Paris. Um, we oui. we both were in Paris last week, and we have both traveled back to the United States for this show. And correct, just for Nirmal you, is just for you. And and Nermal is fresh off of the boat. Well, actually, I think you took a plane. Um, <laughs> and I, one day, one day, I'll take a boat, and we'll do. I'll do it from a boat. <laughs> We're going to do a KubeCon, a KCD from a boat. There we go. A, tra- a floating KCD is what our, our, our ultimate plan is. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who would, who would, we want to know in the chat, actually, who would join us if we were to have a, you know, like a, an American cruise line. Because uh, they have rock and roll days. I've They have a, a ruby one on a boat. I don't know. We're getting down a rabbit hole. But okay. the point is, is Normal is back, but yep. he's a little jet lagged. So we got to help him today with all the questions he he does he may not admit that he needs a little help but he might miss something 
So you out there, your job is questions for our, our wonderful guests, which we're going to get to in a minute. But if you didn't know about this show, welcome to the live stream. We're here every Thursdays. Uh, Thursday, I have locked Normal to his desk. He is not allowed to leave it on Thursdays. And he is here. And we're going to co-host our way through everything we learned on KubeCon. We've got a whole new series of guests we're planning for the show from the Kubernetes or the, the cloud native projects that keep growing and growing and growing. Uh, we've got AI coming up soon. We've got, we're going to talk about machine learning ops or ML ops. We've already got that guest locked in. So if you didn't get to watch this show live, you get to watch it on your ears because that's how you listen. Uh, so we're going to have a podcast about all these episodes. Yep. You can join on the podcast now. Just go to brettfisher.com. Um, the links are all below. Or just go in, in your podcast player and search DevOps and Docker or Brett or Normal or something like that. And you will find all of our wonderful episodes. Um, like we just had Daytona on. And you can see down here, look at all these people that were on the show and involved with the show and edited the show and produced the show. It's so fun to do this yep. with my friends. So yes. you can join that on, join us there on your podcast player, um, or you can get updated on this that is, podcast and this live show. Yep, and this is where you find out uh, what's coming up on the next show. So where can folks find that out? On brett.news. Brett.news. So, the uh, links are, again, all these links are below. You can watch yep. them later. Or when you're listening to this podcast, you can click them below later. And They're all in the show notes. if you want to continue the conversation, uh, check check out our Discord, uh, where we hang out. Um, I think there was a high was there a high fivers uh, recently. We did. We just had a high fiver. So if you're willing to buy me a coffee every month, you can be in this little group of people I call the high fivers. Nermal's a part of it. I, I, he's just sort of grandfathered in. I don't know why we have him there, but uh, we have all <laughs> these wonderful people that on randomly show up, and we have a monthly hangout. It's kind of like lunch with your DevOps friends. And yes. we do that in Discord. We talk about projects. This this week, we talked about AI again and what projects people are looking into, how they're using AI for DevOps. And, oh gosh, we had we had multiple other topics. We talked about conferences um, and things all related the, to DevOps. I don't even remember half stuff. of what we talked about. Yeah. All the KubeCon stuff. There was a lot of announcements from KubeCon. We covered that last week on our live stream from KubeCon, from the floor of the Expo. Check out that episode from last week. And yes. coming up soon, another conference that I'm involved with, DevOps Days Raleigh. Uh, we've got great amount of sponsors, um, awesome program of speakers. Uh, come check that out. It's April 10th and 11th, uh, essentially two weeks from now. I'll be there. If you're in the area, register now um, and uh, come hang out and, and learn about cloud native, DevOps, Kubernetes, and Docker at the DevOps Days Raleigh conference. So um, if you're not familiar with DevOps Days, there's a bunch of them worldwide, but I help organize the one locally in, in my neck of the woods, but there might be one happening near you too. So I, I highly suggest you check it out. They tend to be really awesome volunteer run with uh, great speakers and kind of more of an intimate conference setting. You know, at KubeCon last week, Brett, how many people? It was like 12,000. It was like 19,000 or no, 12,000, 12, right? 12,000 people is a lot. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. And that can kind of be overwhelming sometimes, but the DevOps Days conferences are a little bit more intimate and uh, you get to meet locals or other folks that are in yeah. the industry around you. So come check out the DevOps Days Raleigh if you're in the area or if you are willing to travel out to the Durham Raleigh area in North Carolina and you'll get to see me and uh, we, we can hang out. It's amazing how many people Nermal and I meet that are involved with a, with a DevOps days in their city. Like yes. meetups are definitely still cool. <laughs> if you're involved with meetups, good for you. I applaud you. Um, you know, it's, that's the hard yeah. job. The hard job is running human events in real life. That's a really hard thing to do. Uh, but the DevOps days has always been an interesting thing because it's completely community driven. But it's amazing how many cities have one and how many times we go to these conferences and meet somebody, whether it's Austin or Boston or Raleigh or some other place in the United States. I don't know how international it is. I don't see, I didn't, don't think I really met anyone yeah, there's, that does EU. There's, ones, a ton, there's a bunch. All but right. that's not what you're all here for today. Brett, who are Indeed. What, what, what do we got going on today? Whoa, so, what's that? 
we're all talking about Kubernetes to Docker. And who better to bring in the conversation about how do I run, I mean, how do you even describe this? How do I run Kubernetes tools on top of Docker without having Kubernetes installed? That's basically what we're going to get into today with our special guest. I feel like this is like the ultimate news panel where we've, we've brought in everyone from all parts of the globe. Uh, we're spanning three continents right now. Um, yeah. So, okay. Right next to me, you've seen him on the show before, Neil Creswell, uh, CEO of Portainer. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be back again. Yeah, it's been a while. it's been a hot minute, maybe three whole weeks or so. Yeah, but uh, we did have Neil's like been on. He's one of those people that just sort of shows up every year, gives us an update. Huge fans of Portainer on this this channel, this show. My community, mm -hmm. our community, just loves uh -huh. it. Uh, but we have now a special guest below, Stephen Kang, and he is the product. Oh boy, I forgot product engineering lead. Uh, it was not on my my screen, and. I'm probably messing that up. Yeah, product engineering lead at Portainer. So in case you've used Portainer before, this is the person that you need to thank because he's doing the hard work. And he's coming out of New Zealand. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Hello. Good to be here. Yeah. And we're going to look, everyone, like we're going to talk a little bit about why this exists, but we're going to get into some demos. So stick around for the demos. Uh, yes. Steven's already prepared some cool stuff. We're all zoomed in, ready to see how the, exactly this works, because I get a lot of questions when I mention this project. And Neil and Steven are here to answer all your questions. So get them into chat. The first question is, how did this even come to exist? Like, why? OK, so the main reason was Voltaine has been doing a lot of work at the edge, the uh, industrial edge. So we're getting more and more customer pickup and deployments of Portana in uh, Industry 4 projects. Um, and so we're getting a lot of exposure to uh, Docker running on an open PLC type device and then uh, Industry 4 software solutions being shipped as containers. So you now have to think about, well, how do I get this, this container-based application up and running on now thousands of very, very small devices. How do, how do I do that? Um, and yeah. so, you know, that, that, that's a real challenge. Now, you, ordinarily you'd say, okay, well, don't worry about it. There's, there's, a, there's a bunch of, of industry tooling you can use. Yeah, but all that industry tooling is for Kubernetes, not Docker. Now, obviously there's Portainer, but you know, um, there, there, are, there are particular reasons why you might want to use some other Kubernetes native tooling. Um, and so the, the, the question came, well, how could we, how could we use all of this very rich CNCF ecosystem of tooling against devices that in no way, shape, nor form are capable of running any of the Kubernetes distros that are available today? And what I'm talking about here are ARM32 devices with 512 meg of RAM. If you're lucky, uh, a gig of RAM. Um, these are the devices that make up 90% of Far edge deployments and far edge could be a factory floor um, where they're running automation that controls robots or machines. It could be an oil and gas field where there are very, very small uh, devices that are connected to sensors on oil rigs or on ships uh, up wind turbines. There's a bunch of, of far edge systems where the devices that control them are just incredibly small and there's just no way of running, running, uh, running Kubernetes on them. So that's that's where this thing came from. It was it started out as as a thought idea. You know, is it possible? And it kind of went from there. All right. Now we have the premise. Uh, I mean, the first one of the first questions we had too was like, is it? You know, a lot of us Docker is so small and K three D is so small that when we're thinking of our maybe home labs or like Raspberry Pis, we sort of think about, well, this all runs fine there. And we don't really maybe, unless you're a, a deep, deep engineering nerd and you start to analyze the actual MIM and CPU usage differences of maybe like a Docker or and we've got some Swarm fans in here, so we're going to get those Swarm questions. Uh, and like that differencing from K3D. And a lot of us know that story of K3D and how Darren Shepard sort of was frustrated with the lack of a Kubernetes that was you know a single binary that was very small and efficient, didn't have all the unnecessary drivers and extra features that you, most of us didn't actually need in small setups. So K3D, weirdly, was started just like K3. this. It was sort of a hobby project yeah. for an engineer on the side. And now it's almost 
it's a it's a household name in the Kubernetes world. Uh, do you when you look at this thing, is it does the profile vastly different? Is it is it really much more efficient for these smaller devices? Well, when you've got 512 megabytes of memory to play with, right? Every megabyte counts. Um, yeah. you, and a lot of the industry for software solutions, interestingly enough, are Java based. And so memory really counts in that regards. Um, and what we, what we found was when we tried to run K3D, K3S, K0S, micro K8s, we tried to run these lightweight distros, they all to even just idle a distro. So, so the, the base operating system and the distro, either Docker and K3D or or Docker and these other, oh, sorry, uh, Linux and these base um, right. micro distros, they still needed between 450 to 700 megabytes of RAM to idle before you even run anything, before you run your apps. Um, and that's that's just too much. Yeah. Uh, and, and also the the way that they handle the, the, the quorum, um, it, it's quite quite hard on disk IO and you end up burning out your, your your, your flash, you know, flash memory cards oh, yeah. pretty quickly. Okay. Um, and so if you're actually deploying and redeploying and, and you've got lots of, lots of, of quorum updates, you start to wear out your, your, your flash pretty quickly. And when you think about true industrial settings, remember this is not designed for home use. This is designed for industrial use. You, you don't want to be going out and replacing your, your flash cards on sensors on a gas pipeline or somewhere in the middle of nowhere, you know, every, every yeah. other, every other month, you just can't do that. So you want something really, really reliable. Um, and, you know, K2D on top of just Docker, it's 20, me 20 megabytes of memory. That's it. Wow. So that's it. 20 megabytes of memory. And when it is not doing anything, so remember, or oh, I should say not remember, but um, it's a translator. It's not running Kubernetes. It's, tra it's, it's translating incoming API requests to Docker API instructions. When you're not, when it's not translating anything, the CPU is zero. It doesn't do anything. So it's only when it's receiving an inbound API request does it, it does a real time translation to Docker and then it and then it stops. So the CPU is nothing. There's no quorum because there's nothing to keep in in, in a quorum state. So CPU yeah. is is near zero. This guy is near zero. Memory is twenty megabytes. And so and this is we're talking about for one node, right? Like this is just a single node solution. This isn't like a clustered solution for many. Although we'll get into that. I guess we should clarify what a cluster is and what do we quantify but you mentioned quorum so it's not like this creates three control plane nodes like we think of when we think of kubernetes or swarm this is just talking to a single docker engine yeah so i, I should go back and then go forwards so that it depends how you think this is either an emulator or a translator right they that, that depends on how, how you want to think about it from a a kubernetes perspective from it from a from someone using kubectl or any other commands to interface with 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 k2d it is it is basically kubernetes right it's basically kubernetes from a docker perspective if you if you log into the host you can run docker commands and as far as as far as you can see on the host it looks like docker right so it's doing real-time translations what it takes is a single standalone docker host and makes it emulate or look like a single node Kubernetes cluster. So it's not it's not clustered. There's no there's no swarm support yet. And yes, we've had people asking for swarm, and maybe that maybe it will come in the future. Um, it wouldn't be that difficult to translate to swarm commands, to be fair. Um, but right now, it takes a single Docker host and makes it look like a single node Kubernetes cluster. Interesting. Right. So. That's that's ten per that's less than ten percent of like a typical memory usage of of like a standard like those those other um, micro K eights and uh, K three S solutions. That's a significant reduction in the amount of uh, utilization of resources. And you kind of also mentioned that it sounds like it's more event driven, right? You were saying that if there's no if it's not doing anything, it's zero CPU. If if I understood Correct. that correctly, is it so? Is it event driven? Like, is it triggered by, uh, like an a, like a Kubernetes API call, and then it like spins up and like responds to that event? Um, 
Can you kind Correct. of go and, into and, and how are you getting that optimization or that performance out of that? Yes, yeah, Stephen system? can probably talk about the architecture because I'll, I'll 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 get lost real quick. But it, it definitely the, the, there's definitely a REST API that's listening and it's listening for the inbound Kubernetes instructions. It then goes through. It, the, the, there's, there's a job engine that runs in the background. Um, and that that job engine takes in command request, translates it to Docker commands, and executes it against the Docker daemon on that machine. But but basically, when 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 it hasn't been triggered by an incoming API request, there's nothing to do. Stephen, feel free to expand on that if you if you so desire. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. And I'll be going through the architecture, so that'll yeah. answer most of your questions for sure. Yeah, let's do it. I I think we're ready for the like. The yeah, demo sure. time. We need a sound for demo time. I, I, maybe I said this before. <laughs> Normal and I. Let's let's make a little mental note. We need like demo time demo or some sort yeah, of. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> something so, pizzazz. Let's... Something pizzazz. Show us what you've got, um, Stephen. <laughs> it's a. Is that okay, a Rick and Morty let's go. Uh, quote? All right. Uh, let me jump into the screen. Okay. There. Ooh. All cool. right. We can see it. All right. We got gotcha. you. You gotcha. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Okay. So yeah. So before I dive into the demo, I wanted to quickly go through the key to the architecture, so it gives you better understanding. So it comprises of three main components: API, controller, and the adapter. So the I'll go with the API first, and you can think that API as the the normal Kubernetes API server. It's really similar. So as a Kubernetes user, you'll be using a tool, something like kubectl, and then you'll be interacting with the Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster with the kubeconfig file, normally with the context sent. And say when you execute kubectl get namespaces, that's going to trigger the REST, REST API call to the API server, and then it'll do the job. k today is pretty much following the same model. So the, the user will be using a tool like kubectl with the kubeconfig that's generated by K2D. You will be interacting with our API, and that API will be handling pretty much the same Kubernetes REST API, REST API calls. Uh, but the only difference is that because we wanted to minimize the footprint, we only support a number of resources. We don't support all the available Kubernetes resources. Uh, so those supported resources and operations can be found in our doc. So stuff like namespace, you'll see the supported operations, create, list, delete, uh, node, PV, pod, and so on. So you can check our docs for that. And that's what the API handles. So it's just a API server that's listening to your Kubernetes requests so that uh, that's why the, when it's an idle, the memory usage is pretty much near zero because if, without the request, it's pretty much staying idle, doing nothing. Uh, so let's say uh, if I request a namespace creation to the K2D API, then the API will then trigger a call to the controller. And what the controller does is it, it's going to come up with the sequence. So what I mean by sequence is that you can definitely create just a single resource, just like namespace, but then Kubernetes can be comprised of, you know, like namespace, deployment, and service. So when you want to deploy a deployment, you have to make sure the namespace has to exist. So because this is not a real Kubernetes, we are doing the emulation, what controller does is that it's going to come up with priorities that, okay, the namespace will have to be created first and then the deployment and then the service. So the controller's job is to make sure that the requests are processed asynchronously, but in the right order. And let's say coming back to the namespace creation, uh, then what it will do then is that it will talk to the adapter, which has two subcomponents, sub and one is the converter. And you can think this converter as the emulation, just like what Neil talked about, or translator. So behind the scenes, what it does is that it's going to accept the namespace 
object, which is the native Kubernetes object, then it's going to translate it into the native Docker API compatible object. So it's going to deconvert, do the conversion, and then it's going to execute that Docker compatible API to the Docker engine using the socket. So that's what the converter does. And once the namespace is created and the client, the user will be running uh, kubectl get namespaces just to check the namespace has been created. And that's when the API will then talk to the adapter directly. And this converter is actually bi-directional. So not only we translate the Kubernetes to doc object, we actually do the vice versa as well. So when you do the kubectl get namespaces, it's behind the scenes, it's well, the namespace is translated into Docker network. So behind the scenes, it's going to trigger a going, well, Docker network list. And then that list will then be converted back to the Kubernetes object. And then it will be presented to the client. So that converter is the main one, the main component that does all the translations. So does uh, the mean last, that the... Yep. Does that mean that the Kubernetes API that you're supporting are, are it's it's kind of this the surface area of Docker that makes sense? So there's Kubernetes resources that don't have any real translation into like a Docker kind of native right. resource, and so right. is is that basically the API boundary or the APIs um, that you that K2D exposes is the subset of Kubernetes API that makes sense for a Docker engine, essentially? Yes. OK. Yeah, where, where there but is that a also means that you can still like, for use. Example, for example, um, uh, the, the load balancer service. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. load balancer service, there's no, there's no natural translation to Docker. But there is, because when you do, with, with, with a Docker um, expose of, of an application externally, you can expose using load ports. So when you ask for a load balancer service, we simply allow you to, to deploy a container using the low ports um, on the host. Um, whereas if you do no port, we force you to do the high ports in a Docker network expose. So yeah, there, there are things where, where you can actually do you know, brain matching and say, actually, this, this isn't a direct one-to-one -one comparison. There's no such things as a load balancer on Docker, but what does a load balancer do? It looks like this. Same thing with the volumes. Um, yeah, we, we will go and create a Docker volume behind the scenes and yeah, PVC or PV and a PVC, same thing. It's we create a volume and we map it. So um, does that mean that you can use the same tooling like Helm or Customize or something like that, so long as you're only, you've got Helm charts only for objects that are supported by the K2D API, but any tooling that uses KubeCuddle or, or the Correct. Kubernetes API, that, that it just works then, right? Essentially. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So the list is on the left hand side here and plus Helm. So we also support Helm as well. So as long as yeah, it contains the supported resources, it's all good to go. Got it. I'm curious, were you able to utilize some of the existing Kubernetes libraries in building this so that um, it would redu reduce the amount of work you had to do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much what we did. So um, yeah, get the, uh, the you, well, it's, it's all built with the uh, native Kubernetes um, library and Docker yeah. library as well. We'll be using, mainly using SDKs. Okay. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's so good because could... it could be a lot of work. This seems like, it, it feels like a lot of work if you had to write all this from scratch. Yeah, like Kubernetes, yeah. like keeping up with the new versions of the Kubernetes API, like you're just kind of keeping up with it because you're uh, adopting the SDK. So yeah. I'm sure folks want to see you in action. You want to want to spin up something uh, with K2D? Yeah, so I'll do that now. <laughs> it's all vaporware until it's the demo. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> it's, it's all theory. OK, so yeah. OK, so I'm just running a uh, Docker engine, version 26. That's really hot, the new one. <laughs> yeah, hot, and, hot, hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And this is a very small device, you see. Uh, well, it says 466, but it's half a gig of memory. So it's a very small device. And yeah, K2D is 
perfectly fine for that. So what I'll do is, so this is the, this is our website, uh, the installation guide. So if you want to give it a try, make sure you read it and you will see the hardware requirements. It's like really small. So yeah, a V7, and that means a 32 bit, right? That means a 32 bit, uh, kernel and yeah. Docker. Okay. Right. Well, yeah. Yeah, and as we said, K2D runs on Docker Engine, and yeah, it's pretty much this. Uh, the only thing to be noted is the advertise address. So this is this is going to be your main IP address that you, the K2D will be exposed to. So just that IP is the only important bit in here. And the secret is the well, it becomes the token, so token to interact with K2D. So that's also, you can set your own, or if you don't set it, it's going to be generated automatically. So this is up to you. Okay, so I have a small snippet here that I'll be running. So do that. Okay, so that was it. And when I print out the logs, yeah, so that's running fine. So now what I'll do is I will be getting the kubeconfig file. So if I, so this is interacting with the K2D endpoint that I specified. Okay. And when I trigger it, you'll see the typical Kubernetes kubeconfig file, you see. So the API version plus the CA data and then the server and the token. So it's pretty much identical to the kubeconfig file you know in the Kubernetes world. So now what I will do is I'm just going to put it at to my local machine. OK, so what I just did is I just have overwritten the kubeconfig, the local file, with the K2D one. So now what I can do is kubectl get namespaces. Whoa. And now I can see some namespaces there. So it's so so the so what just happened when you just did kube cuddle get namespaces is what you just mentioned earlier right so really this is just doing a docker network ls command and mm. pulling out some of those networks as uh namespaces kubernetes namespaces right and in air quotes now everything all our all our kubernetes resources are now <laughs> Air quoted. Air quotes. Uh, um, <laughs> very cool. So namespaces if a namespace are pretty... falls in the wood, though. Like it's still, it's still. <laughs> as long as we don't look under the Docker commands, we we never know, right? <laughs> yeah. So That's namespace right. yeah. is pretty pretty straightforward. Um, what what, <laughs> what about running a service, right? Running some some service or uh, pod or something like that. Yeah. Well, then the other so thing you, you do a, a kubectl gets. Uh, get SC. You can actually, you can actually see the, the the storage classes as well. So you can actually you can go and see a whole bunch of resources. Ooh. So that's how you do your and... your persistence. Got it. So it yep. comes with some storage, some local storage uh, configured already. Yeah. So this is the um, Docker volume local driver, pretty much. So yeah. Is it using labels in the background to associate Docker? Objects with yes, Kubernetes, we use, okay. yeah, yeah, we same use as Swarm, labels, I, actually, yeah, and Compose, mm. actually, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's why um, we don't really get to use any key value store because we rely on uh, a lot of labels, as well as we also create some config config files locally. So yeah, that's how we can get a really small footprint. So there doesn't really need to be like a like when we think of Kubernetes control plane, we think of like etcd or some sort of storage there, database-ish thing. And and it sounds like there's no need for that in this. Like you don't, do you need to write anything no, other I, than the secrets and the config maps and stuff like that? Is there something else that has to get written or is it all labels? Uh, so the only persistence we need is this K2D path right. here. So yeah. it, it stores the, the search secrets, config maps, and then the token. That's right. pretty much all we store. Okay. All the others will be label based. 
pretty much. Interesting. So does that mean that if you're, well, let's get, let's get in, uh, let's get back to the demo and, and get a service running. And then we can, I can ask some more detailed questions because you're, you're percolating some really good questions in my mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Faster than you can write them down probably. That, yeah, yes. yeah. That's good. Yeah. So um, what I'll be deploying is a service called, well, software oh. called NodeThread, and yeah. this is really popular in the um, industri industrial IoT space. So this manifest contains a namespace, a deployment, and just a bunch of stuff. And you see we are actually creating a PVC as well and mounting it. So the system volume plane and also service, but I am creating it as a load balancer. So I will show you exactly how it translates load balancer to Docker world. So what I'll do is the manifest is available in our website in the common IOT application examples. So you can go and take a look at the list up here. Okay. So Let's see if the, yeah, so you see the node red namespace has been created. And as I said before, that's the Docker network behind the scenes. So that's been done. And if I do kubectl uh, get pause, node red, woohoo, that's running. Nice. And I can also do logging as well. So you'll see the logs coming through. Nice. So just like Kubernetes, you can feel it, right? So yes. you can, and then the thing you will be interested in will be the service as well. So because there there's no concept of load balancer, just like Neil said, in the Docker world, but Docker allows you to use load ports. So what that means is we can actually set the external IP to the actual host's IP and then expose it through that. So that's how we emulate the load balancer. We also support node port as well. And we, what we actually do is we emulate high ports as well, which is higher than 30,000, which I'll do the demo later on. So if I now go to the browser and go 1880, you'll now see the node bread is running. So you see that I just deployed a pure Kubernetes manifest with the load balancer service type. And you can now see that I can interact with it. And the last thing I want to show you is the PVC. So you'll see the PVC object as well. And by the way, the capacity is shown as zero, and that's because there's no way we can grab that information from Docker. So that's mm. unfortunate, but yeah. And and I do PV. Oops. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> well, while you're figuring that out, um, there's some resources that you deploy on Kubernetes that <clears throat> might be permission to request API information from the Kubernetes API server, um, like metadata information, labels of things that are like controllers. Is that concept supported with K2D or is that kind of out of scope of what you would, what you intend to run on something like K2D? We, we uh, actually, sorry, can you uh, we, we, we actually play with host file entries and we actually create a host file entry in each pod that that will resolve the kubernetes.default.service. So from within a pod uh, that runs, you can actually resolve that one and you can actually, so a pod can actually run, have access to it as well. So. Got it. Yeah. I just want to make, uh, I just want to okay. recap real quick for everybody. <laughs> like if you're <laughs> yes. just joining us and you're like, what is so interesting about this Kubernetes command line that you're showing? Uh, this is not a, uh, this is actually not a node red demo, uh, but what we just did was we launched node red uh, the web interface and everything with, with some storage on a tiny machine with a half a gig of memory. So it's running container D run C Docker D and then the, and then a, translator or no, we don't we don't have the right word or i'm not remembering the right word for this kubernetes api emulator on top of it 
and as well as the app all on a half a gig of memory, which yes. uh, like just let's just let's pause for a second and, t- yes. and say like we couldn't do that yesterday uh, or you know an hour ago at least i couldn't so yeah, that's I can a pretty honestly cool see by, by, by the expression on, on memo's face there's a smile on his face he's like what has just happened here <laughs> yes yeah i'm i really like this um i think anything to do with squeezing the most amount of performance out of the compute that's available yeah. is is a goal is is something that's good because I think we we end up um, like very uh, uh, our default is with like these big servers um, where we kind of assume there's always resources around, but um, we forget that there's a lot of the IT world that runs on small things that can't be updated, that are uh, resource limited, and um, that also have been starved of the awesome tooling that's been created in the cloud native kind of environment um, that allows for easier deployment, um, those nice APIs that you get from Docker and, and, and Kubernetes. And um, I, I like seeing this kind of uh, bringing, that, bringing that goodness to uh, these resource constrained environments is, is always exciting to me. So that's, that's where this big smile is coming from. Uh, Neil. Um, but that being said, we did get a really good question from Andrew B in the chat. In the case that this, you know, we, we just mentioned that this is on less than half of a gig of memory. Um, so in the case that CPU memory and disk space runs out or is exhausted, what, what happens? What do, how does K2D deal with that? Well, there, remember, there is no K2D cluster. So, so right. basically, uh, if if you if you run out of memory, Docker uh, OOM will kick in and will start doing okay. its out of memory reclaims, and it will kill some things, whatever it needs to do. Um, if it happens to kill the KGD container, um, we have a restart policy set to always anyway, so it should just restart. Um, if because it's stateless, it doesn't actually matter um, as long as KGD restarts, uh, then everything will continue. So there's no it, you know, everything. All the state we need is held in metadata on the containers in Docker, um, and that's it. So you can actually, you can in fact delete KGD and, and redeploy it, and you'll just continue off and you continue where we, we left off. So that's pretty straightforward. Yeah, that's Very really cool. that's really neat because then you could also just like if you if you had like a one time deployment, um, unless you need to change something, K2D doesn't even need to be there, right? Like. Like you if you need it. to kind of just, yeah, you could just stop it or, or it could just be deployed or, or you could have it only run every once in a while to receive command, you know, receive yeah. some kind of commands on the schedule yeah. and then remove itself so that you can even reduce the limited resources that it's taking at that time. So that's, that's pretty neat. <laughs> yeah. And what, what Stephen didn't show, but you can, if you want, you could actually, you can do a, a, a Docker run command on Docker and then immediately alt tab kubectl get and it will show you what you've just done in docker as if as if it was done in kubernetes um so the whole thing it, it, it's a genuine two-way translator so you can have people who know docker interacting with the docker host directly people who know kubernetes interfacing with the same host as if it's kubernetes and and kgd in the middle does does the translations oh very cool yeah. so how, that's yeah, what i was here. just oh, about to say yeah, good. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that, that's exactly what I was about to demo. So you oh, see that um, I can actually do the Docker run, and I'm running a thing called Mosquito. And then as soon as I do kubectl get pods, I'll see the Mosquito pod running. So it's actually bi directional management. So if you're familiar with Kubernetes, go with kubectl. If you're more a Docker person, you can go with Docker. So it's quite flexible as well. That's awesome. And again, again, we, we, we built this for the industrial IoT market and the people on the on the shop floor are probably less likely to to be you know, up to the play with Kubernetes, but they, they, they may be familiar with Docker. And so that is trying to help the IT OT convergence by allowing OT people to use Docker, IT people to use Kubernetes, and they're actually interfacing with the same thing in real time. Very cool. I didn't even think about that. Oh, Brett, you're uh, 
you're on mute or something like that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's weird. We, we keep talking over each other. Who's who's not hearing me? Um, sorry, I had a quick question. It's a little bit of a subject change, but we just had you on less than a month ago talking about Portainer. And we did talk a little bit about how Portainer can manage the edge. And we, we showed off some of these like profiles and you could throw in thousands of nodes. Um, I'm curious, like if, if you could compare and contrast those two models for like, I guess... Does, doesn't the portainer have to have an agent on the edge device in the case of portainer? I, I, I'm just trying to figure out, like, do these things fit together or they kind of end up being two different options for edge deployments? They, they can be used together or, or they can be used apart. So when you deploy K2D, there's a switch. You can just do, I think it's dash dash portainer agent, and we will automatically deploy the portainer agent and register it with your portainer instance. Um, so you can just do that uh, automatically. Um, however, if you don't want to, if you want to use Argo CD to manage all of your uh, K2D fleet, then you can do that too. Um, Stephen, if we have time, actually can can show us using Argo to control K2D. Um, because if, if we don't show you, people won't believe us. Um, but <laughs> it, it, it's it's very easy to manage to manage K2D either with Portainer or without, um, and they are there for you know, kind of different markets. So if you if you can. Use Docker on your small devices, and you and you only want to use Docker. Then use Docker. If you have to use Kubernetes tooling, and you need to you need to be able to use that tooling on devices at the edge, then that's where KTD comes in. Okay, interesting. I'd love to see a demo because that to me this was the one thing that I when I was talking to other engineers at KubeCon about, and th of course we all just assume that it can't handle all whatever, 100 plus resources in a Kubernetes cluster that are sort of part of the standard API set. And uh, the, you telling me that Argo works on it, I would just reply to them and say, well, Argo works. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, or they would say, oh, well, now I'm interested. Like the, 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 now you're talking like some significant uh, uh, tooling that, you know, Argo is not a simple little tool that only uses a couple of resources. It's kind of a big thing <laughs> so yeah let's talk yeah. about it so yeah let's get into it so this is a cluster that that i added before well in advance so you'll see this ip is where k2d runs and as you see it treats it as a kubernetes cluster it shows you the version and connections success so it's all good to go and how to add it is in the uh, advanced configuration doc. So you can go and take a look at our Argo documentation down there. Okay, so I'm just gonna get deploy a app quickly. So I'm just gonna say, uh, I'm gonna be deploying Node-RED again, and I'll set the sync policy to automatic. Um, the other ones I'll just set to default. So in here, I have a small oh by the way the manifest i'll be deploying is this guy uh this time it's just going into the default namespace uh but the difference is is, is that i am actually using the host pass so you you don't actually well it supports host pass as well so if you want to right. buy mount then that that's also supported and this time the service will be created as a node port so you'll see how we emulate the high ports as well cool yep so let's uh, we'll see the node red that's pretty much it oh i need to select the cluster and namespace i'm just going to put it to the default one cool now i create Cool. So the sync is okay. Oh, I'll just and when I do the refresh, cool. That's yeah. all synced. So, yay! <laughs> so now all the deployment and service is now all deployed and synced. So from this point of time, you will be able to do the traditional GitOps stuff, which is quite cool. Yeah. And coming back here. Uh, just gonna do Docker PS, and you'll see the Node Red running. Yeah. So, so technically, and, you in the, oh sorry, go ahead. Oh sorry, and you see the high ports exposed as well, which is three zero seven eight three. 
So if I now go to this guy and specify the high port, it will interact. Interesting. There you go. So just to recap, you have Argo CD um, configured to pointing to your, your GitOps repo on GitHub with a manifest mm -hmm. uh, or a, a configuration for this application that has a volume, uh, a host uh, bind mount volume and mm -hmm. uh, a node port. And then uh, you, you had Argo CD synchronize it to K2D. And Ar from yes. Argo's point of view, it just looks like a normal Kubernetes cluster, right? Like you didn't configure Argo in any, exactly. any kind of like weird way. Um, nope. to, nah. to, yeah. And then it just deployed that application um, and configured it. Awesome. Yep. And presumably, Pretty like, much. yeah. And I mean, I'm assuming in this scenario, right? Because we have these tiny little devices, we wouldn't be running Argo on the devices. I'm guessing it would be running central on a more capable yeah, piece of hardware. Because I'm guessing that Argo uses a lot more resources than K2D does. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But Stephen, if you, if you go back and just do a, a kubectl get nodes, you can actually see that it's just a single node, a single node cluster. You know, that, oh yeah, yeah. Emulates. Yeah. So yep. Just one. Awesome. And, and it, I saw that it was emulating one dot twenty eight. So the it's, API. It's, yeah. So that's kind of your. Yeah internal approach to you at least tested, you know, you tested on 128. So at least the standard resources you support, uh, at least com are compatible with 128. That's, that's pretty slick. And I honestly think like to those, like there's a lot of scenarios where the, it just doesn't matter. And, it, and no one would know, uh, that this really isn't a full Kubernetes control plan underneath. And we had, a, we had a real quick talk before the show about, you know that this technically this scenario isn't uh what, what's what's the word the uh sort of kubernetes api compliance tests or whatever like that it probably wouldn't pass those i'm guessing uh, uh, actually, no way it will pass, <laughs> pass them okay no way <laughs> i mean you know you've, you've surprised me before so i'm thinking like yeah you're probably like yeah it flies it, it totally works with flying colors. I mean, if, if we were if we were able to to constrain them yes um but you know we we tried to be as as honest as we could uh in the um the, the docs and on the kg website we've listed everything that works and there's there's also a limitations page we've listed everything that doesn't work and what mm -hmm. we plan to add in the future and what we don't uh, things like like our back you know our back doesn't we don't really need that at the far edge um uh, daemon sets because it's a single node cluster we don't need that but we we already already can do persistence so we've we've got a got a list of the things that we that we've got there yeah we we do already support configs and secrets um as you can see the secrets are not, not encoded um so as as we go through you you can see there's a there's a bunch of things that we do and things we don't do and while we've not done it a lot of them are by design um there's no need for it right. for this particular use case but yeah you know, as as the use cases begin to vary, we can we can emulate kind of anything that we need to emulate that makes sense. Yeah, Conrad, you've already got a request. Conrad's asking, what's the roadmap for supporting host networking on Docker Desktop for Mac? <laughs> it's also uh, um, Docker Desktop for Windows as well. It's actually just the host network because it's actually a host emulated on a host, so it doesn't like the the, the, the double host. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you can actually use the bridge network. You can you can change change the KDD deployment to use bridge network, and then it works fine. If I'm not mistaken. Um. All right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, the the and that would obviously like. I mean, we have full Kubernetes in Docker Desktop, so I guess it's really for Conrad to because he's already the one implementing this right now while we're talking yeah, about the show. He's, he's literally running the getting started right now and going through um, <laughs> proper proper engineer. Um Steven, what else? Do you anything else in there? You, we only have a few minutes left, but I didn't know if we had finished all your demos or uh no that was pretty much it. I'm pretty happy that I was able to do all the demos I prepared. It works. So, it's all good. <laughs> it yeah, did work. Yeah, it worked. Uh, yeah. We do have some K9S <laughs> fans, uh K9s fans on the show. So I'm just trying to think of like what possibly thing we could prove, and if you I don't know if you have K9s installed, but uh, just proving that it would run and list things is maybe. I mean, we I think we've kind of proven that at this point. Uh, I'm just trying to think of 
other cool things to show off I, because we have we have some yeah. Plans. So, so I, it, I feel I feel like work. any any tool that's using like yeah. the Kubernetes API should work. Like Open Lens should work. Uh, yeah, K nine should definitely work. Uh, I can't imagine it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think there's also tools that you can probably have used into multi multiple clusters. Um, and I think that would be a real, uh, any UX or any tool that does a multi-cluster view or a multi-cluster yeah. aggregation of, uh, of uh, aggregated view would probably be really awesome because each of these K2D nodes is, is an individual cluster essentially. Right. Um, and so there's no, there's no concept of a cross K2D aggregated cluster, correct? Like multiple K2D nodes acting as multiple nodes to a single cluster? No. no. So the, okay. So this, is, this is different from the likes of, of, of KubeEdge. You know, KubeEdge is a CNCF project where you, you emulate one giant virtual cluster and then all of the edge nodes become workers. This is, this is a different approach. This says, well, you're actually going to have some kind of central uh, cluster manager and all of your nodes are discrete clusters. So, you know, they're, they're both trying to achieve the same thing, really, really low footprint on the device. One says move the control plane into the cloud. And we say make the control plane as small as possible. Cool. Um, are you exposing metrics or observe, you know, how do you get some of the details on CPU memory, yeah. disk yeah. utilization? What's, what's going on there? That's on the roadmap. So say, that's okay. actually the, yeah, yeah. So that's actually the feature I was working on. So yeah. Okay. It's on the roadmap. Awesome. Uh, so speaking of roadmap, yeah, we, we have a few we, minutes we, left. We plan, yeah, sorry, we, we plan to port um, the equivalent of um, Docker stats across. So when you when you do the metrics, API, the metrics APIs, you'll get the Docker stat, the equivalent of Docker stats. Awesome. Oh, and um, cool. so speaking of roadmap, uh, we got like one minute left. What's on the roadmap? What's what's next, Stephen? Uh, well, metrics is one, and we were thinking of supporting container D as well. It's in the future mm -hmm. roadmap, but container D will be much more lightweight. So that's something we were considering. And if you go to our K2D website, well, GitHub, and when you look at the issues, you'll see some of the uh, future requests that's coming through. So like IPv6 support, uh, job simulation, ingress service so those are the uh future support that well that's what what's on the road man awesome well phil estes we had on the show a few weeks ago if you're listening to this phil uh check out the container d issue on uh k2d um it looks like they're trying to integrate with container d so if you're out there phil check it out it it does. I mean, it is. It's a. I was going to ask this question because this is a great little conversation that we don't have time for. But you know, like if the goal is to help people that are familiar with Docker, obviously removing Docker from the equation is kind of weird. Right. But also, it does remove a layer of a daemon always running in the background. And and could mm -hmm. we get even lighter weight with container D and then maybe like CTR built in or something so that you can at least do some of the low level stuff mm -hmm. that you don't have to build in to every single command of the key control. That, that would be an interesting side project. And then show sort of like the like full K3S, lots of memory, lots of CPU, disk IO, and then like K2D with Docker is like in the middle and then like K2D or K2C, uh, <laughs> K2CD, there we go. Um, down there at the bottom of like the absolute minimum possible, we, you know, we can't possibly get any thinner. <laughs> Yeah. any leaner uh, <laughs> approach and and who knows i mean this is the kind of thing idea where like and you know someone builds a single binary that has container d and k2d and everything all built in and then now we're off to the races and you know so <laughs> cool who knows what possible what's possible um well it, okay so people can get started on the uh on the website i've been sending all the links out about the, on the github they have the website they have the docs they have the getting started guide i mean this is like this is not day one uh, this is close to day one for them on this project, but they've already got docs, already helping you get started, mm -hmm. already have people filing issues. So if you think this is, if if, if you work in industry or if simply you, you need a new life for your old Raspberry Pi 
OG or like Raspberry Pi 3 or something that was like a V7. I think I had one of the V6 or V7 CPUs still lying around in my closet somewhere. Uh, if you want to check that stuff out, this is the project for you. Uh, Steven, is there like, other than the GitHub, is there, do you have a Discord or a Slack or anything for people to jump in? Or how do they, how do they reach out to you and the team if they have issues other than get other than github i guess github's obviously an no. option github it is Get, okay. github and, and we've got uh, github discussions oh yeah great awesome. always forget about those um <laughs> we'll just see well think <laughs> yeah yeah uh and, and find your find your email on github probably and uh send you an email or linkedin or where, wherever you can find all of us uh we, we keep talking about how we're all on linkedin even though we don't necessarily want to be um <laughs> Well, thank you both for being here. This is a fantastic episode. I was actually really excited to dig in, and it did not disappoint. Uh, I'm sure that Normal and I will be talking to Phil and other people in the, the Container D ecosystem when we see them, uh, if not at the next KubeCon, about this little tiny, even tinier approach to uh, scenarios. And honestly, in the Kubernetes community, I think there's a lot of room for options uh, around maybe we don't need the full Kubernetes. Maybe we need just half like half Kubernetes or something. And uh, you know, a lot of people go to Swarm for that. We have people on the on the chat that were, were saying, oh, we've already mentioned Swarm, you know, five minutes in. Uh, pro Cheeseburger, I see you. So that's gonna be something that we maybe were put into the issues. I can see one of the people from our community yes. requesting that. Um, and being able to have even, uh, you know, the ability to deploy onto a Swarm from a tiny little thing that's still actually running Kubernetes. Um, anyway, what a world we live in. Um, all this cool tech. Well, thank you both for being here and we'll thank see you, you on the next it. one. Yeah. Next week, we're going to have you. chain guard on, uh, yeah. normal, normal. I think we'll be back. We're gonna have yes. chain guard on talking about small images, which could go with this small deployment. And we're going to be talking about yes. tiny images, the progress of the chain guard image repo and how they're now on Docker hub, which is amazing for everyone. Yes. We all get to use it from Docker hub. So we'll see you then. See Bye, you everybody. All. See you. Bye.